John Story's essay The Culture and Civilization Tradition explains the contribution of Matthew Arnold and F. O. Lewis towards the understanding of the concept of culture. Throughout history, powerful minorities have always been concerned about the popular culture of the majority. Those in positions of political power have often sought to control and police the culture of those without political influence, interpreting it for signs of potential political unrest. They used patronage and direct intervention to reshape the culture in line with their interests. However, in the 19th century, there was a significant shift in this dynamics. The new working class culture had two main sources. First, there was a culture offered for profit by cultural entrepreneurs who recognized the potential market among the working class. Second, there was a culture created by and for political agitation involving radical artisans, the new urban working class and middle class reformers. E. P. Thompson's work, The Making of the English Working Class, provides a detailed account of this cultural transformation. These changes posed a threat to traditional notions of cultural cohesion and social stability. The commercialization of culture through profit-seeking enterprises weakened authority, while the emergence of politically engaged working class culture directly challenged established political and cultural hierarchies. The powerful elites who feared the potential destabilization of the social order were alarmed by these developments. It marked the beginning of a divide as described by Benjamin Disraeli between what he termed the two nations. Eventually, this division gave rise to the first political and cultural movement of the new urban working class, Chartism. The study of popular culture in its political context emerged from this historical backdrop. The changes brought about by industrialization and urbanization set the stage for a more complex and dynamic cultural landscape where the concerns of the powerful and the aspirations of the subordinate classes clashed and shaped the course of history. The study of popular culture in the modern age is said to have originated with Matthew Arnold's work despite his limited direct discussions on popular culture. Arnold's significance lies in the fact that he introduced a specific way of understanding and situating popular culture within the broader realm of culture known as the culture and civilization tradition. Though Arnold's writings, particularly Culture and Anarchy, is the primary focus of his contribution to the study of popular culture, his influence extended beyond empirical research. His general perspective profoundly impacted popular culture studies from the 1860s to the 1950s, shaping debates and discussions in the field. According to Arnold, Culture encompasses four fundamental aspects. Firstly, it is a repository of knowledge, often represented by his famous phrase, the best that has been thought and said in the world. Secondly, culture is concerned with promoting reason and the will of God, leading to sweetness and light and manifesting its moral, social and beneficial character. Arnold emphasizes that culture is not merely about possessing material things, but rather about the inner development of the mind and spirit. It is a study of perfection, focusing on becoming better individuals rather than acquiring external circumstances or possessions. The essence of culture is to seek the best and ensure this knowledge benefits all of humankind. To attain culture, Arnold advocates for a disinterested and active engagement in reading, reflection and observation to acquire the knowledge of the best. Consequently, culture encompasses three aspects, knowing the best that has been thought and said, possessing that body of knowledge and applying it to the inner condition of the mind and spirit. 
Arnold underscores culture's role in addressing the issues of the time, ministering to the deceased spirit of society. However, he condenses that culture's primary function is not in direct practical actions to remove specific evils, but in inspiring people to seek culture for its own sake. This pursuit of culture for its intrinsic value is what Arnold terms cultivated in action. Arnold's definition of culture includes the ability to know what is best, what is best, the mental and spiritual application of the best, and the active pursuit of what is best regardless of direct practical involvement. Arnold's work does not explicitly define popular culture. It becomes evident that he uses the term anarchy partly as a synonym for popular culture. Anarchy or popular culture represents the disruptive nature of the lived culture of the working class, particularly concerning their entry into formal politics in 1857. Anarchy and culture are highly political concepts and the social function of culture is to control and manage the perceived disruptive presence of the working class. He expresses concerns about the working class lived culture referring to them as raw and uncultivated masses vast miserable unmanageable masses of sunken people and emphasizing their disruptive behavior in political protests he sees the working class as asserting their personal liberties in a way that perplexes and challenges the established order during the suffrage agitation of 1866-67 Arnold's class-based discourse becomes apparent though he presents society divided into barbarians philistines and populous his claim of a common human nature does not mitigate the class distinctions he makes arnold implies that the aristocracy and middle class are further evolved along an imaginary evolutionary continuum compared to the working class Arnold illustrates his perspective on the common basis of human nature using examples of negative traits like ignorance, violence, envy and brutality attributing these characteristics to the populace or the working class. This reinforces his belief in the distinct evolutionary positioning of different social classes. He believes that culture serves a crucial role in addressing the challenges brought about by historical changes witnessed in the 19th century he perceives the present difficulties arising from granting the franchise to the male urban working class compounded by the historical development of industrial capitalism for him the franchise has empowered a working class lacking proper education for such power leading to dangerous consequences due to the erosion of traditional hierarchical values like subordination and deference arnold sees education as the means to instill culture removing the temptations of trade unionism political agitation and cheap entertainment this in turn would curtail what he considers popular culture or anarchy he advocates for a cultured state as a solution given the decline of the aristocracy's authority and the rise of democracy the cultured state would combine culture and coercion to control and curtail the aspirations of the working class until the middle class becomes cultured enough to assume this role regarding education arnold envisions different paths of each social class For the aristocracy education is about accepting their decline and moving away from their historical role for the working class education is to civilize and mold them into a state of subordination deference and exploitation he sees working class schools as outposts of civilization in a largely barbaric working class environment aiming to civilize the children before instructing them in contrast education for the middle class prepares them for power and transformation the goal is to turn a narrow ungenial and unattractive middle class into a cultured liberalized and ennobled one where the working class can look up to with aspirations 
Arnold's ideas can be summarized as advocating for a revolution by due course of law, essentially a revolution from above to prevent popular revolution from below. His focus is not so much on defining popular culture, but on using culture to maintain social order and authority. He sees the working class culture as symptomatic of political disorder and emphasizes the role of education in subduing the working class and instilling authority. Arnold's vision of culture centers around a small cultural elite, the clerisy or aliens, whose purpose is to preserve and guard the treasures of the past civilization. They are tasked with guiding the progress of society and policing the unruly forces of mass society. His historical perspective leads him to doubt the potential of democracy and popular culture, considering the majority as unsound and always prone to moral failure. His paradoxical vision revolves around a self-perpetuating cultural elite whose work is to maintain adequate ideas for themselves and other similar circles of elites. Arnold believes that the mass of humankind will always be satisfied with inadequate ideas and only the highly instructed few can handle knowledge and truth in their full sense. This elitist perspective leads him to reject practical politics of protest and opposition, leaving authority to handle political matters. Lewis and Levisites were heavily influenced by Arnold's cultural politics, which they applied to what they perceived as cultural crisis in the 20th century. They believed that the cultural decline identified by Arnold in the 19th century had continued and worsened over time. The spread of a culture of standardization and leveling down was seen as a threat to the finer aspects of tradition and the implicit standards that order a more refined way of living. Lewis's core assumption was that culture has always been preserved and upheld by a minority. This minority, which once commanded cultural deference and authority, is now facing a collapse of its influence. The masses, previously content with acknowledging the traditional supremacy of cultural standards, were now challenging and questioning this authority. Edmund Goose's concern about a revolution against taste through a plebiscite was seen as coming true leading to a hostile environment of the cultural minority. Lewis and Thompson believed that civilization and culture were becoming antithetical terms, as the power and authority were no longer aligned with culture. They observed that even those who showed genuine concern for civilization were consciously or unconsciously becoming inimical to culture. This hostile environment posed a challenge for preserving the finer human experiences of the past and maintaining the delicate balance between culture and civilization. Lewis perceives mass civilization and mass culture as subversive threats that have the potential to plunge society into irreparable chaos. To counter this danger, he advocates resistance to mass culture through education and the efforts of an active minority. The rise of democracy in both cultural and political matters is deeply concerning for Lewis as it challenges the authority and influence of the cultured minority. This collapse of traditional authority combined with spread of mass democracy creates an environment conducive to anarchy in their view. Lewis identifies specific aspects of mass culture for criticism. Popular fiction is condemned for providing addictive forms of compensation and distraction, leading to an avoidance of reality and weakened mental capacity. Cinema, particularly Hollywood films, is seen as dangerous due to their hypnotic emotional appeals and vivid illusions of real life. The popular press is considered a powerful de-educator of the public mind, while radio is accused of stifling critical thought. However, advertising draws the strongest condemnation from Lewis. 
described as unremittingly manipulative and masturbatory in its pervasive influence. In response to these threats posed by mass culture, Lewis calls for a conscious and directed resistance to protect the finer aspects of culture and intellectual authority from being overwhelmed by the forces of mass civilization. Lewis views advertising as the primary symptom of cultural decline. This perspective is rooted in Lewis's attitude towards language, considering the debasement of language as not just a matter of words, but also of emotional life and the quality of living. Advertising is accused of reducing the standard of living by corrupting the language and emotional experiences of the entire language community. Lewis often looks back nostalgically to a cultural golden age such as Elizabethan period where there existed a shared culture uncorrupted by commercial interests. This period is seen as a time of cultural coherence appealing to both the cultivated and the populace simultaneously. Lewis idealizes a cultural coherence based on authoritarian and hierarchical principles where everyone knew their place in society. This golden age culture was destroyed by the changes brought about by the industrial revolution, though some remnants of the organic community could still be found in 19th century rural communities. The loss of this organic community with its living culture encompassing folk songs, folk dances and traditional craftsmanship is lamented as a profound decline in the way of living and social arts that had been grounded in immemorial experience and a responsive adjustment to the natural environment. Lewis asserts that the decline of the organic community has led to a deterioration in the quality of work and the growing importance of leisure. In the past, work was an integral part of life, but industrialization has disconnected individuals from their work, resulting in an unsatisfying and incapacitating work experience. Workers now seek compensation and distraction through mass culture, which is likened to a drug habit, offering only temporary relief and not true recreation. Lewis uses a literary myth of the lost organic community, emphasizing its values and standards to draw attention to the pursued laws in the contemporary society. While acknowledging the negative aspects of the organic community, Lewis focuses on the cultural and literary tradition as a means of preserving and renewing cultural values. The authority of literature and culture has been eroded and Lewis aims to re-establish it by dispatching cultural missionaries to universities and schools to maintain and promote the continuity of England's cultural heritage. Criticism of Lewis's approach to popular culture is common, but it is also recognized that historically Lewis played a his crucial role in applying literary analysis techniques to popular forms. By challenging prevailing canons of aesthetic judgment, Lewis had far-reaching consequences and unsettled established notions of high, middle and popular culture, ultimately contributing to the study of culture and its evaluation.